Give me honor to God, our creator, our provider, and our redeemer. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves, as we give honor to our illuminated Supreme Mother Mildred Davis Miller, to His Holiness of Blessed Memory, Master Malvin Davis, to Jesus the Christ, to blessed saints of all religions, all faiths, to our Supreme Father Marshall Davis, to our Supreme Mother Aletha Ravina Davis Drake, to the officers and loved ones of our temple, of our cities, of our states and our countries, to our friends and family, to this congregation at large, I greet you with Hotep. Shalom. Peace abide. We'll begin with the reading of our scripture as I get my glasses here. And this comes from the 60th Psalm. And this is Psalm is called Victory with God. You have rejected us, O God. You have broken us. You have been angry. Restore us. You have shaken the land and torn it open. Heal its fractures from its quaking. You have shown your people hardship. We are staggered from the wine. We are staggered from the wine you made us drink. You have raised a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee the, the bow, Sheila. Respond and save us from your right hand, that your beloved may be delivered. God has spoken from his sanctuary. I will triumph. I will parcel out Sechem and apportion the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my wash basin, in Edom I toss my saddle, in Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me the fort to a fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? Will you no longer march out, O God, with our armies? Give us aid against the enemy. For the help of man is worthless. With God, we will perform with valor, and he will trample our enemies. I've read the 60th Psalm in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Blessed Mother. Amen, amen, amen. And now let's, in unison, uh, repeat the Lord's Prayer. But I you know to keep your mics muted so we don't interrupt each other as we're speaking. So here begins. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 And now our song is called There's a Fountain Filled with Blood. And the first line of the song is the same. There is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's name. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. All their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. That's our song, it's a fountain. And now for our meditation, again, keep your mics muted, but repeat after me. I call this meditation, knowing God is on my side. Please repeat. There's a great joy in knowing that God is on my side. Although I may waver from the Lord's blessings, God is always my guide. I shall forsake 
the illusions that confound me. I shall cling to divine love. Fill me to overflowing with your blessings. You are my God, and in you I shall abide. Amen, amen, amen. And now, this is another repeat. This is our, the prayer from Yom Kippur, the, the homework that uh, Supreme Father gave us for this year. And with this prayer for the year, this, he gave it as a homework assignment of doing some things. And then Father Rodney Williams actually put it together as a prayer that can be repeated. Uh, we do it weekly, but he said he's going to repeat it, Father Rodney, so he's going to repeat it every day to remind himself to work at these things uh, this year. So again, please keep your mics muted and repeat after me. This day, I make the decision to improve my health. This day, I make the decision to improve my material circumstances. This day, I resolve all emotional issues in a manner that brings balance and improvement to my life. This day, I elevate and enlighten my mind in ways to advance my understanding by meditating and reading good material that will tell me of my divine nature. I thank God that this is so. Amen, amen. Amen. Okay, and as I said, our, uh, our lesson to the day is called The Wishing Well of Potential. It's based on the October message. And one of the lines that we'll hear when we get there is there is a well of potential that you need to discover and tap. Applying the principles of truth is the best means to have them work in your circumstances. And that's a portion of the October message that we got from, uh, that we have for the temple for our Supreme Father Marshall Davis. So we'll be talking about that in a bit. But when we're talking about potential, I want to look at the word potentate. And uh, potentate is, a, is a, a name, usually of official, that means possessing great power. Um, it comes from a Greek word, dunastis, and it means a mighty one. And it comes from the Greek word dunamia, which means to be able. Uh, and it's a person who possesses great power and, a, and authority. Now, it's the word uh, uh, dynastis is used a couple of times in the Bible, but in one instance in uh, 1 Timothy, Timothy, the sixth chapter and the 15th verse, uh, the word is translated as potentate. And I'm going to read this chapter this uh this verse from first timothy timothy and remember that's the sixth chapter in the 15th verse and it says which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and the lord of lords and of course this was talking about the christ the jesus of christ and saying that he is the only potentate that he is the, is the power and the ability to let us know that there is a, uh, a potentate, a power, there's ability that all of us have because we have that Christ spirit within us. So we need to look at ourselves as potentates. Uh, just like they say, king of kings, we can be a potentate of a potentate because when we connect us, when we're connected with the Christ force within us, we get abilities. We get the ability to be able to conquer uh, with all the circumstances. Remember, just because you're a Christian don't mean that you're not going to encounter things in life. All of us, all mankind encounter things, just like all of us walk out and we encounter the sun, we encounter the wind, we can encounter um, uh, the rain. All of us encounter things. But when you walk through those things with the Christ, you have an ability to be a conqueror and a more than a conqueror against all the circumstances that we face in life. We almost look at ourselves and saying that conquering is possible because God is in charge. You know, a lot of times when you listen to news, you hear all these things and you hear all people trying to do all kind of 
tricks to sh try to show they're powerful. But, but to me, I often think about the fact of people that are trying tricks to show that they are powerful are forgetting where the source of all power comes from. It comes from God. If you tell me that you are more powerful than God, I think that you have gone crazy. If you tell me that you can somehow uh, outsmart God through your lies and through your tricks, then I think something is wrong with you and wrong with your mental abilities because God is still on the throne. God is still in control. God will still lead his people and lead us to the things that we need to do to make sure that his truth and love survive. And, that mean, and I don't mean that you just sit back and do nothing. I mean that God will give you the, the, the ability to conquer and to prosper no matter what they seem to throw at you. Because just because they do crazy things don't mean that you can't prosper. It does not mean that you cannot find joy and uh, happiness in your life. And those should be the main things. Yes, it may seem sometimes that they are getting up a hand. It may seem that they are getting uh, all the silver and the gold and all the possessions. But do they really possess the joy that God can put in your heart? Do they really possess the understanding and the wisdom that God can give you? Do they, in, uh, do they have the encouragement that God can give you? Did they take away the fear? Because I see a lot of things they're doing, they are a fearful people. They are scared people. They are uh, coming up with all kinds of lies and excuses to try to hide their fear. Remember when we were studying Marcus Garvey, he said that they are people who bluff through their life. They, they, and they end up beginning to believe and bluffing is a way of life. But if you have that Christ spirit in you, if you have that faith of God within you, you don't have to bluff. You don't have to bluff about your uh, happiness. You don't have to bluff about the things that you face in life. You can face life with truth and love and be a, like I said, a conqueror and a more than conqueror. You can be one of the kings who are of that great king. You can become one of the lords who are are one with the Lord. In other words, you can be a potentate. You can have the ability to make your life a blessing for yourself and for all those around you. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about that word potentate. So I, even as you listen to this, listen to this uh, lesson that we're giving, keep thinking to myself, I am a potentate because I am connected to the only potentate, the Christ spirit. And that Christ spirit, because remember potentate means to have ability. So it means that when you're connected with the source of abilities, that you then too also have potent abilities. So be that potentate, be that one of those kings of the king, be one of those lords of the Lord, so that your life can find the happiness, the joy, and the answers to all the questions that come into you in life. So are there any questions or comments before we start? And what I'm going to do is first, I'm just going to read the entire message and then we'll go back and talk about the message. And like I said, I call this message, the wishing well of potential. And for those who can't see the screen, that there is a, a graphic with a wishing, well, of a, a wishing well with the word uh, potential on it. Um, but let me just read. Understand much of your reality is what you perceive it to be. It's also predicated on how you react to people and circumstances. However, you should know perception of reality is not always real. Seeing in part as well as partial decisions are made with partial facts, which result in inadequate responses and inappropriate behavior. The individual who chooses to play with you, to manipulate you and control you do so because they have a knowledge of how you will respond to them. Even animals can sense how you feel. Be appropriate in your circumstances and respond wisely to instigators. 
Listen to what you do not, I'm sorry, listen to what you do not hear being said as much as what is being presented. Do not allow others to program your thinking and behavior with, uh, which lies mixed with elements of truth. Let me read it again. Do not allow your program, do not allow others to program your thinking and behavior with lies mixed with elements of truth. Work to de-stress. Engage with people and with things that create joyful experiences for you. Make good plans. Focus and execute your plans to assure quality and leave the intangibles to God. Knowing you have done your best. Seek to enhance your friendships with those who have shown themselves to have integrity. Win others with a smile and loving kindness. Create beauty about yourself. Identify things about you that you need to change and improve. Do not be satisfied with the same situation. Do not, uh, do not perceive stress, dis despair, and poor disposition as your permanent reality. Know the power of positive thinking can reshape your life. Align your thinking with positive attitudes of the universe. Do not succumb to negative energies or negative people who are negatively influenced and as such create cycles of negative experiences. There is a well of potential that you need to discover and tap. Applying the principles of truth is the best means to have them work in your circumstances. The truth that arranged and established a new life of beauty for others can work for you. Work it and act to make desirable changes in your life. Read the 60th Psalm, burn a green and purple candle together this month. And that's the reading of our message for October. Um, and it's, it's talking about that positive attitude, but with the positive attitude doesn't mean you neglect the truth. Uh, so many people, when they just try to be positive, added, uh, want a positive attitude, that they will neglect the truth. And what it really tells you is recognize the truth, but then know that you're able, that God gives you the ability to change those circumstances. Uh, because it begins off as saying, understanding that much of your reality is what you perceived it to be, but in its and much of what you do is dependent upon how you react to people and circumstances so you have a choice on how you react to the people and circumstances around you but you should know and he said however you should know perception of reality is not always real so just how you perceive things is not always how they really are so you have to be careful with your perception uh, and, th and this is more so you don't be an ostrich and try to be so positive about things that you don't realize that you can see the problems around you and then do something about them and thinking, oh, I can just ignore a problem and go away. It's not saying ignore problems and they will go away, but it's saying when you have problems, always go into them uh, with that potentate attitude that you have abilities to overcome them when you work with God and the Christ spirit within you. Um, it says, seeing in part as well as partial decisions are made with partial facts, which result in inadequate responses and inappropriate behavior. So if you just see things partially, remember we want to see things in whole and know that part of the whole has to be revealed to us by the spirit. So when we see things and we only see part of them, then our decisions are not going to uh, be up to par because we're only using part of the facts and that is going to result in the way you're uh, inappropriate or um, inadequate responses so we have to make sure that we're open to receive not just the part but the whole and sometimes the whole isn't all pretty and is all not always clean but it is the whole that you're dealing with and when I'm saying hold, I'm talking about W-H-O-L-E, 
So if that's what the, the complete picture is, deal with the complete picture, but realize that they're part of those complete pictures that you can say no to, that you can choose not to be a part of, that you can choose to find a better path. Says, and, and one of the things he said to do is individuals who choose to play with you, to manipulate you and control you, do so because they have a knowledge of how you will respond to them. So if you are always in the habit of getting, some, you know, people that try to manipulate you, do it because they know that certain things uh, get you upset, certain things that uh, trigger you. And when they know those things that trigger you, then they do that to manipulate you and get you into a state of consciousness that you're not going to make the best decision. Um, and sometimes people like salesmen, they kind of uh, get a, see an attitude of the person and they will try to use that to manipulate and control the person to get to change them into thinking that they have to buy and they have to buy now. You know, usually when I always go into something, I always tell myself beforehand, I don't have to buy it now. And I do that for one reason, as if I'm going to run to a salesman, is because the salesman's job is to get you to buy it when, to buy it now, to throw things at you to think you, you've got to make this decision now. And one of the things that you can learn to help you to make better decisions is having in your mind, I don't have to buy this now, uh, and I don't have to use this salesman as my only source of information. And that doesn't mean you don't buy it now, but always have in your mind that even that salesman, the salesman is going to try to give you the things that you need to actually make a decision to buy it now. And you just need to have to protect yourself by saying, uh, uh, recognizing, I don't have to buy it now. I don't have to buy it from this salesman. I can get this. Uh, if I get it now, I'm going to do it because I've made a decision that I want to get it now but not because this person is going to try to manipulate me or control me or flatter me. Because many times uh, uh, in close, you know, there's something that sells have what they call a closing. And many times the closing is almost uh, there to try to um, shame you into buying. And I say shame you into buying by saying something like, uh, is, this the, uh, uh, is this the time that you're now going to step up to uh, be the you know the great person that i see in you and that person you know you're thinking that oh this person uh sees me as somebody uh, uh great and you will buy it because you don't want to be little than that person you know be, be made little in that person's eyes but the truth of the matter is why do you care what they think of you you're buying a thing because you need it you don't you know just buying something because you think the salesman uh, uh, sees you as somebody or sees you as somebody great is not a good decision on why to buy something uh, because salesmen know that and they will use that to try to control you and manipulate you uh, so you can say, oh, I don't want to lose my status. What status you have with the salesman? He is not a part of your life. He's not going to be with you uh, if you're buying a car. Is that salesman actually going to be with you after when you're driving that car? No. Is he going to you know, be with you tomorrow at lunch or anytime? You don't have to please or show anything to the salesman, you want to get something that you can use in life. So don't let people manipulate you and control you because they see the type of attitude that you have about life. Um, and sometimes just like I do, go in there with some of those controlling factors or some of those things like saying, I don't have to buy it now. Um, it's part of your mindset to know that and again, I say, doesn't mean you're not going to buy it now, but you're not going to be manipulated into buying it at a time that you have not actually made a definite decision. So don't do it with, uh, when it's talking about having those partial decisions, when you have part of the information uh, or you've been manipulated away into thinking that there is pressure on you to have to make this decision, take time uh, to do that. I know even one time I was studying about, it's a book called The Art of Negotiation. And in this, when the thing that they were telling negotiators to do is one of the reasons that they send a negotiator uh, to many meetings and things is so that the person that makes the final decision 
is not there. And most people are saying, well, wow, why, you're not gonna send a person to the negotiation that can make the decision? No, why? Because that gives you time to think about what it is you're negotiating on. So you send someone who's a negotiator, but that negotiator always has to go back to someone else and they make the decision. And many times when they do that, when that person's negotiator, yes, they could make the decision then because a lot of times it's just a rubber stamp, but they always go in with the impression uh, and they say, when you negotiate, always go in the impression that you have to go and check with someone else. That's why so many salesmen, when they want to sell something to uh, a husband and wife, they want both of them there. Why? Because they figured now I got all of the decision makers in the room now. So from the salesman standpoint, they want to try to get all the decision makers there so they can make a pitch to get you to do it now. But when unions and others negotiate, they always try to make it seem that there is someone else we have to go to. Uh, even, if even if you send the top person in there, he's gonna say, oh, I gotta take it to my membership. Why? Because in negotiation, you want to give yourself the time to think about it, to see if it's something that you missed. But when you go there thinking that, oh, um, uh, we're here, we can make decision right here. We can do it right in front of the salesman. Uh, sometimes go to the, you know, to, uh, leave the salesman for a while and talk to the person and talk about things and talk it out. Don't let that salesman be there a part of your decision making. Because remember, who do you have to live with? The person that you uh, uh, are actually married to? Or do you have to live with the salesman? So why should the salesman be involved in it? Why should that person uh, who is with you has to have the salesman to, because remember the salesmen are trained to uh, are trained and they have all this information that they have to help you to make the decision now um, and you may need to look up something you may need to deal with your feelings about that thing so don't always think when you're making a negotiation because that's what they teach in negotiating always give yourself time to think and one of the ways the negotiators do that is they always make it seem that it's someone else we have to go to to make this decision. Because um, even say that we think that um, we, you know, we have this poker face and we can see, but it says even animals can sense one, uh, how one feels. So it's saying a lot of times when you're with these people that are trying to manipulate you, they can sense how you feel. Uh, when a husband and wife are together saying that they can sense which one actually uh, starts having feelings for buying this thing. And they're gonna use that information to do, again, to try to get that person to do all they can uh, to buy or to uh, embarrass the other person to um, uh, make them uh, give in to the feelings of the other person. And I guess I need to explain that. But this is what you, you'll get a lot of times when you have uh, someone trying to sell you um, uh, a life insurance and the you're there you're the husband and the wife are both there and they're trying to sell a policy to the husband what they will do is they will start saying things to the husband about uh doesn't you know how his wife and family are going to be left if he doesn't get insurance now again i always say is yes you may want to get insurance to protect your wife and family but is this the right salesman is this the right policy but if you start thinking about your feelings for your wife and uh then while you're there in front of them uh you almost feel like oh if i say no to the salesman that i'm telling my wife and family that i don't love them but that is not true you might just be telling that salesman that no you don't want to buy it from him no, you don't trust everything he said. No, you want to look into it deeper. But people know and see how you feel. Even though you think you may have a poker face, they have some idea of your feelings. They have some idea of your leanings and don't allow them to use that information to make a decision that is inappropriate. Uh, it's part of making that decision with partial information uh, because you have gotten so distracted by the feelings that you stop looking at the facts of the situation. 
Then it says, be appropriate to your circumstances and respond wisely to investigators. So it says, even when you're talking to others, uh, get, you know, have the right mindset while you're with people who are investigating you. Um, and again, having that idea that you are potentate, you have abilities. And you want to make sure that you don't speak too quickly, that you are actually making wise responses to what they're asking you, that you have thought about it. Because here, the next line says, listen to what you do not hear said as much as to what is being said. So that means that you have to kind of listen to that spirit within you. Because who are you, if you, because it's saying that you're listening to what is not being said as well as what is being presented to you. It is the infinite spirit within you, that intuition within you that you need to listen to and hear what it is saying. Because it'll start telling, letting you know what are some of the things that the person is not saying? What are some of the things that the person is not putting into the proposition to actually uh, uh, make the decision? I think, uh, and I've been talking for a while. Are there any comments or questions so far? Yes, good morning. Can y'all hear me? Shalom. Yes, shalom. Great lesson, Father, lining up with things that not probably not just me, but everybody else is encountering. You know, I was speaking to you this morning. It kind of reminded me of when uh, I started doing leadership. Mm hmm. You know, you have to do your presentation. Mm -hmm. But they was trying to figure out how did I go from zero to 100 so quick. Mm -hmm. It was because it wasn't all about trying to sell it, mm -hmm. the product. It was about making people understand Amen. that it's not a matter if, it's just a matter when that you may be able to use these tools and these tools will be able to help you and your family. You know, we, we, they offer you a identical shield, then they offer you a lawyers. Mm -hmm. And the thing where I used to start off, first thing when I first started, God had put in my spirit, always be prepared because nothing is what it seems. So the best way to influence people is to let them be able to read things for themselves. Mm -hmm. That way they get that full understanding. Yes. So I made sure that I had all the videos lined up. I had all the flyers. So when I did my presentation, I had it all lined up. But, you know, I always let people understand that I also have these tools. And it's not about everything. It's not about the dollar. It's about being able to try to help someone else, mm -hmm. you know, and uh so you was you was lining up the things that you was you were saying is lining up because it's the thing when people is out trying to sell products, they often think about trying to line up their pocket, but yes. the thing is too that you have to be calm minded to know that and all the way to get where you're trying to get, first of all you have to be honest and second of all yes. you have to be patient. And yes. I always tell people, listen, this may be something that you think will benefit you and your family, then it may not be something that you think will benefit you and your family. But if it is, always remember, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we go to these, these different type of things now, and uh, everybody probably wish now that they can call on a law firm, especially if not for them, for their kids or their grandkids, because there's so many uncertain things that we have to battle on a daily basis that we don't know whether we go on or come. And even with our so-called friends or people we know, you know, that you will put your trust in them and think that you reach out to them and they will help you. And it seems like they tell you anything just to get that dollar. You know, they like you were saying, they say what they think you want to hear. You know, it's almost like when you meet a person getting ready to start a relationship, everybody's going to say what they think you want to hear and they're going to try to be that person that you're looking for. And six, seven, eight months down the line, you kind of find out by who is this? What mm -hmm. have I got myself into? Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I just thank God for the lesson and just want to 
come online and 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 say that you know, like I said, I I I, I thank God for you the way you explain certain things and and the line of God bless me as I went down to Florida and I was down there and he, and he said in my spirit it was time to go ahead and resume my legal shield, you know, and uh, he gave me another opportunity up here in Oklahoma and and I'm preparing myself and. You know, as I was telling you this morning, I can all, I already see where things is trying to come to deter me. But it's the mm-hmm. difference between deterring you and separating you. It's all right if it comes to deter you, but as long as I don't let it separate me from God, as long as I don't let it take my focus, as long as I don't let it come in and try to play with my beliefs, you know, and knowing that God has given me favor. He has given, he not given me a spirit of fear. He's given me a sound mind that I can do anything you know, with him, as long as I keep him first, as long as I'm willing to abide by his commandments and keep my his word and my spirit and, and just speak with him and talk to him and hear his voice, mm-hmm. not no stranger voice. So I, I just I just thank God, you know, for this lesson this morning, and I just wanted to uh, say that. So I'm going to go back on mute. Oh, no, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Because when you were speaking, that reminded me that, because uh, yes, sometimes you are in position that you are uh, a sales, but uh, because that not only does study negotiating one time, but I studied uh, sales, and as a uh, uh, one of the books that a lot of the salesmen get is by a guy named Ziggy Ziglar, if I remember the name right. And Ziggy, one of the things he would tell he he would tell the salesman not to use some of those uh, tricks, but they're just trying to manipulate your emotions. That if you want to be a good salesman, first of all know the product um, and give the people the truth about the product. And if you are truthful with the person that you'll not only get that sale, but you will get additional sales. Cause he said, if you keep using tricks on people to make sales, you won't get additional sales. And like uh, when you were saying how you would be able to get more people, when people know that you were giving them the, the true information uh, that you would, uh, study the product and be able to be able to give them information about them, seeing what things they need to do to make the decision. That is what a salesman is supposed to do. They're supposed to help people find the information they need to make the decision. Um, they're not supposed to be trying to manipulate them and just find about their feelings and play tricks on them. And Ziggy Ziggler, when he's saying, and if you're a salesman who always try to learn all the closing tricks and how to manipulate people, that you're not going to have as many sales as a person that goes in there, gets the information, be able to present the information, and you'll see that you would not only get that sale, but you'll get other sales. Uh, or you know that person may tell someone else, look, if you want to actually get the understanding of what you're involved in, they will send people to you because they know that you are the type of person that is not just trying to sell them, but you're trying to help them get the information they need to uh, to make the decision of whether they can get it or not. So there, there's a there's a way that you can use the truth uh, and actually be a better. According to Ziggy Ziglar, uh, you'll be a better salesman by giving people the truth than one that try to just try to manipulate people. Uh, and he says that those type of salesmen will be actually more successful than the others because when you're a manipulator, just like you're saying, people can start to feel if you're there to help give them the truth or if you're there just trying to manipulate them. Just like I said that, you know, when it says even animals can sense how you feel, sometimes you can sense, uh, if you open your eyes, you can open your eyes and see that this salesman will tell me anything. He will use any excuse for me to get that. He's not going to try to, you know, and you you can have a feeling that they're more worried about their pocket than they are about giving you the information you need. Uh, and we should develop that sense so we can tell which kind of salesman I got. Do I have one that is willing to tell me any type of lie, any type of uh, uh, fact about my life to to make me go ahead and buy? Or do I have one who's knowledgeable about this product, who understands the product, and who's going to help to guide me to the information I need to make the decision. That's what, because when you have the truth, you start getting the whole information. And this whole thing started about is about making partial decisions. And those partial decisions are often about those people trying to manipulate you, trying to get you to quick, quick quickly go over it. Because remember, uh, another thing Deacon Jackson said is patient. You be patient with the per- person. 
and you'll sometimes say salesmen that are not patient that they're, which they're trying to get you to make decision uh quickly you got to make it now you know a lot of times they'll have these uh sales and things that you know it's a uh, it's a uh, if you get it right now i can get you uh um uh, this deal when it's off but to, and, and it's always you it, it's it's funny but it was seemed where they always have that 40 percent or you know some kind of uh 20 percent or 10 percent deal that this is the last day of the deal that they're trying to sneak you in under that usually that is a lie they can make that same deal tomorrow but to get you to buy it now they're going to give you a time frame of trying to make oh you're gonna you're gonna catch this sale on this thing uh, and so you want to go in trying to get a full fact, to get the full truth. And there are salesmen who will work to be able to be knowledgeable about their product and to give you the, the truth. But there are many of them who are out there that they're just going for the sale and how quickly they can get a sale. So uh, thank you for mentioning it. Did anyone else have any comments? Turn a friend where I'm okay. I think I was said, do not allow others to program your thinking and behavior uh, with lies mixed with elements of truth. And so that kind of is what we're talking about. When they're trying to trick you, uh, they're actually mixing lies about, oh, like I said, you, you know, it has to be done now, or you know, uh, you're you know, you're going to show your wife that she, you don't love her if you don't get it now. That's just mixing things, the mixing lies. They don't, you know, how, how does that salesman know that it has to be his policy at his time uh, to show your wife and family that you love them? That is mixing that elements of, uh, of lies mixed with truth. Yes, you love your family, but do you have to buy from that particular salesman at that particular time to express that love? I don't think so. So don't allow others to program your thinking and behavior with lies mixed with elements of truth. Say, work to de-stress. So it's saying that one of the reasons that we get caught in these things is we what? We go into situations with the stress. Uh, the stress that we know we gotta get it done, we don't, you know, we're under time constraints. And this to me is again what uh, Dick and uh, Jackson was saying about, go into buying situations with patience. Take your patience with you. That, if you take your patience with you, that will relieve a lot of the stress. Don't think that you have to make the, quick, the, the decision so quickly that you stress yourself out and you overlook things. Many times if you take the patience with it, you'll find when you're, especially when you're looking for information or looking for things, other things will start popping up and you'll be seeing them and open your eyes to them. I know we were looking for uh, for chairs and we're looking at deals, getting around with people having different chairs for the temple. And then as, as you keep looking and looking and looking, you start getting, seeing these things about what, you know, uh, what should you be looking at when you're buying a chair uh, for a church? What are some of the things that you have to watch out for? Uh, what, have, what do you have to watch out for in the, uh, the fabric that is made out of? What do you have to watch out for in the cushions that they're made of? Uh, what kind of guarantees do you have? Uh, even, you know, sometimes you even think about what is the, um, uh, the fire resistance of the material that you have? Because you can, you know, get certain things and if you get a fire marshal to come in and test them, they can make tell, I know we used to have that problem at the museum, that uh, we had a curtain in, a, in that room called the jazz room. And uh, over the years, they had lost the, the fire um, uh, retardation properties of the material in that and so we would almost every time we would get written up uh, uh you know in because then when you went to school system the museum was owned by the school system every year they come and they do uh, uh you know a safety check and uh and you know and you ne i never could get to find the the thing and earlier it had it but nowhere could i find the paperwork to show uh the fire resistance of the material in there and you have to think about that uh well you know is there uh there some kind of fire thing about because you want something that in a fire that it does not burn long 
it's even, sometimes even better to have something that just quickly uh, uh, melts. You want a material that almost melts when it hit fire. Why? Because if it melts, that means it's not going to start more fire. It's just going to like melt away. So you have to look at what is the fire of redactation or something. But to be able to start looking at those things, it says you have to de-stress de yourself. And that is what patience does. Be patient knowing that you will be led. But like I said earlier, you need to listen to what is being, which is being said, what is being not said, as well as what is being presented. And part of that, through that de-stressing yourself and being patient, you can get the answers to so many things. Anyone else have any thoughts or questions? Because that they're saying, remember, de-stress, learn to use patience in your life and learn to see what things trigger you not to be patient and, and, and to put that stress on you. You have to work to de-stress yourself. This means it is not easy in ways you have to look at yourself and saying, what is stressing me out? And when you find those things that are stressing you out, just like that earlier prayer we did about that mental and, and emotional health, you have to start saying, you know something? I am going to start finding some new avenues. I'm not going to let these things stress me out over and over again. At some point, I need to find out what things stress me and then find out ways that I can de-stress myself. And even to me, the next line, it says, engage with people and with things that create joyful experiences for you. Start looking at who are the people and what are the things that actually create joy within you and make sure you are putting some of those things in your life. Those things, the people that you need to be in contact with, but people who create joyful experiences in you. But look at what those experiences are. Am I doing something that helps to give me joy? I know what Supreme Mother, she used to have that thing where she would watch Family Feud and uh, the Grand Old Opera. And the Grand Old Opera was all that country singing. And for her, that did what? That just bring a joy to her life to be able to see that, uh, that, that, that family feud show. And she would do it. She would block out that time. It was in Mother House, she would be getting phone calls all during the day and night. But she had to block out some time to what? Where she could have joyful experiences for herself. So she could do just what it's saying, de-stress and become patient um, in her life. So you need to learn out what helps you to create joy in your life? What helps you to find joy in your life and give yourself time to be able to do that? It says, make good plans. Focus and execute your plans to assure quality and leave the intangibles to God. So it's saying you do as much of your, you know, because a lot of times when people have a plan, they think that um, the plan is all there is. And the plan, uh, the plan is there to help you to make good decisions. And when the, something goes outside of the plan, uh, you should, the plan will help you see what things are even going outside the thing, what side things that you didn't think about. Because it's saying you can leave the intangibles. Don't try to, you know, get so uh, 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 thing that you plan it to such a degree that there is, you know, there's no doubt because a lot of times those perfectionists never really get anything done. Uh, because they're looking so much, but you make a plan uh, so that you can sh ensure that you're looking for quality, but leave some of the intangibles to God, knowing that you have done your best. Do your best, but don't be so perfect that you said, oh no, it got to be perfect. Listen to the Spirit sometime and be guided by the Spirit, but be guided by the Spirit with a plan, not being guided by the Spirit without a plan. Because a lot of people think, Oh, if I'm going to be guided by the period by the spirit, I'm not going to have a plan. Uh, it was uh, interesting to me one time when I was uh, studying about uh, what Africans call a ritual. Uh, and to them, there's a difference between having a, a ceremony and a ritual. And for and what they say about a ceremony, uh, a ceremony is something that you kind of plan it all out and you know, everybody has down what they're going to say and, you know, you 
you know, you've made choices on everything that's a part of it. It says that is a, a ceremony, uh, it's sort of like a, a formula uh, that they go out and use as a formula that you think is going to be successful. So Sam, but what then is a ritual? And for the things I've read about the African people that are talking about doing ritual, they said the ritual is a combination of both having a part of it that is planned out and a part of it that you leave to the spirit. Uh, they say that the ritual said part of the ritual is well planned out. Uh, you creating a ritual space, you plan out that space and you uh, like you like saying with now, temple, we have the four corners of the temple that we set up. You do all those things and you plan out all those things, uh, you know, uh, like we have a, uh, here, we have a devotion where it follows a lot of plans to try to get people to, a lot of the, the devotion is to help you to de-stress, to try to get your mind off of some of the cares and things of the world. That's why you have the singing, you have the affirmations, to try to get your mind in the right place. But with a ritual is a part of it that you just turn over to the spirit, that you uh, let it flow freely, that you get involved in it. That's why when our, when, when most of our teachings is not just lecture, 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 there is times where I'll stop and say, you know, what do you have to say? What are you doing? Why? Because you want to open it up to the spirit, open it up to the impressions that people are getting who are around you. So there's a part of it that like a ritual that you leave it to the spirit to bring out what is true. You don't plan so plan things so far out that you don't leave space for the spirit of intuition, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, the spirit of, of joy to be a part of it. And so with those plans, you, that's what it talks here about leaving the intangibles to God. Um, to me, that's like saying always leave space and whatever you're planning, for God to speak to you. Don't be so, so it's always, you know, be so stuck to the plan that you don't have, uh, it's sort of like plan for the spirit to be involved. And if the spirit is going to be involved, it's going to be some things that are from your subconscious and unconscious mind that are going to be involved. So you can't write those down. You, you know, there's no place to, you know, you know no checkbox for uh, what the spirit is going to bring. You need to be open to that spirit helping to work with you. But that does not mean that you do not have a plan. Because like I said, we said with the, with the Africans, I said with the ritual, you do do the steps you have to make a good space for you to have uh, the ritual. Uh, you have it where you I mean, have that space, a lot of things that you're doing is trying to make it have a protected space, a uh, space where it invites uh, or invokes uh, the right attitude when you're going into it. Uh, you need that part of it. You don't want to do things with the spirit and you're open to any willy nilly spirit. You want to make sure that you have set up the process where you're getting uh, the higher spirits, the, you're trying to get it where you're going to be in a strong foundation, that you're going to uh, have the place set up, that you can open the doors uh, to peace and goodwill and understanding. That's the part of the, of the ritual that is uh, planned out. But you always have to have that thing that you allow the spirit to work its way out. You allow, you put some time in there where the spirit is just going to act on the people. And sometimes that's through meditation. Sometimes that is through open discussion. Sometimes that is in to uh, allow people to not just ask questions, but to make comments. Um, because the comments that they're making are the comments that the spirit is impressing upon them at that time. So make, but don't think you don't make plans. Make a plan, but you plan to make it uh, to ensure the quality. Like you plan it so that you know that you're going in it uh, uh, in a space that is uh, protected, that is workable, that there's a process for working it out, but always, always, always leave space for the spirit to work with you in your decisions. So it says, leave the intangibles to God. Let the, have a place in there for the spirit of God to come in there 
but knowing that you have set up the best place to receive that. Uh, even when you do your altar at home, you want to have a place that you are used to listening to God's uh, uh, impressions to you. So you would set up the altar, you put the things in the altar, but you don't tell yourself exactly what you're going to get at that altar every time. No, you have it so that you have it set up, you have that space set up, uh, and then you can sit and listen and then let the intuition, intuition flow. Says, uh, and Denny, have any comments before we go on? Because the lesson goes on to say, seek to enhance your friendship with those who have shown themselves to have integrity. So with friendships, you know, you have around, you know some of the people who are around you that they do things with integrity and you know the friends that you have that will just do whatever. They don't, they don't show any integrity in what they do. But kind of have those friendships and enhance those friendships when you see that the person is working with integrity, when they're working with truth, they're working with uh, the quality in mind. Go ahead and enhance those friendships with those people. Um, and it even says, win others with a smile and loving kindness. So you can get people to be with you by what? Learn to smile and learn to show love and kindness. Show that you care about them, that you care what's happening to them so that you can win people over through your uh, attitude. So even though, you know, even though we're saying that uh, look for the truth, look for what is actually happening, but just because you see things that are wrong still doesn't mean that you can't smile and find some loving kindness towards the people who are involved in it with you because you will help win them over uh, because when you can still uh, show a smile and show some loving kindness, it's just showing your patience. Because uh, a lot of times when we're not smiling, what has happened is we become impatient and we become, we want to rush things. We want to hurry up and get things done. Uh, that's the time to, to, to frown and do those things. But to show that you're willing to work with things or with patience and with uh, the, the truth smile and show some loving kindness uh, with that situation. It says, create beauty about yourself. So that means to create around you some things that give you a pleasant attitude, that help to uplift you. Create those things around you that even does that. So even when you're using your creative ability, when you're using those creative spirit, it awakens that spirit of joy, that spirit of happiness within you. So it's saying, learn to, when you do things, uh, to create some beauty about it. Find something that's beautiful and put it around you to remind you that God is a beautiful God, that God creates things that are beautiful, that God creates things that have color and sound and taste to them. Create it with that beauty in it. I know uh, a lot of times we watch these uh, things that have about them, uh, people, you know, setting up food. And, you know, and even though sometimes I think that plates are ridiculously small, but they uh the way they plate the food is actually a part of the person enjoying the food they don't just take a whole bunch of stuff and just slop it up on top of the plate and and, and just try to uh, appeal to the person's greed they put it on the plate you know they put swirls of stuff they arrange it on the plate in a way that it brings a beauty and they actually believe that that helps to actually um uh, enhance what is being eaten because they have created beauty uh, in the way they have actually even set the plate up. When the person even look at the plate, they're supposed to get a response of somebody cared enough to take the time to arrange this plate uh, uh, in a fashion that it expressed some of the beauty of God. And they say in your, in your life the same way. Sometimes put things around you just because they uh, remind you of the beauty of God. It says identify things about you that you need to change and approve. So that means be on the lookout around you of what things uh, that you need to change, what things could stand improvement, make your mind active. So it's looking. And it's saying that because remember, this we're going to talk about this is a wishing well of potential. There is a place that you can tap into. And many times that thing that you're tapping to is your own inner senses, your sense of beauty, 
your sense of knowing when something is wrong, your sense of knowing when there is an opportunity to improve things. As a potentate, you should have the ability to start seeing those things and, and, and seeing how you can improve the things around you. Just remember that one great potentate, that one king of kings actually will open you, and that's the Christ consciousness within you. It can help show you how to improve the things around you in life and let that spirit of the things around you um, actually help to improve all the things uh, and everything that you do, that you're always looking for. How can I change these things? How can I make improvement in the life around me? Remember, you, want to, you can speak up if you have something to say. So I'm gonna pause again as I go to the next, this, to our next screen, but any other thoughts? Because the lesson saying what you're doing that says, do not be satisfied with the same situation. So it means don't just look around and say, well, you know, it's just let it keep going like it is. Uh, don't just be satisfied when you know there's some things that are wrong around you. Do something about it. So it says, don't just be satisfied and just saying, you know, I've dealt with this for so long. I can just keep dealing with it uh, further. Don't be satisfied. Know that you are what? A potentate, that you have potential. You have the ability to change and improve the things around you because you have the Christ within you and see that Christ within you as a potentate, as the ability to improve and change the life around you. So do not uh, perceive stress, despair, and poor disposition as your permanent reality. And this is important. Say, so do not perceive stress, despair, and poor disposition as your permanent reality. So will we get stressed sometimes? Yes. Will we despair? Yes. Will we have a poor disposition? Yes. But I remember something I think uh, uh, Brother Lewis always says is, this too shall what? Change. It is not permanent. You know, we get into these bad situations and we make them so important because we say, oh, now it's permanently. I have, you know, I've done, lost something that's going to be a permanent mar on my life. Please wake up and know that don't, just because you get stressed, don't think you have to stay in stress. Learn sometimes even with stress how you can breathe stress out. Part of your meditation sometimes is just that uh, out breath. And so when you see yourself getting stressed, learn to do what? To breathe out and relax. Um, because you want to learn and you can breathe out stress. You can breathe out despair. You can breathe out a poor disposition and not let them become a permanent part of you, that you are in that stress, that you're in that for too long a period of time. Because a big, one of the biggest problems with some of the things, the problems we have in life is that we energize them and empower them. And we, like I said, we stress over them. Um, and there's some things you can do about it and some things you can't do about it. So when you, something happens to you in life, you have to look and say, what are the things that I can do to improve this? And what are some things that I can't do that I just have to let the spirit work in? Like I said, when you're working with that ritual, you let the spirit do some of its part. So you do your best and then you do not stress. You do not despair. You do not stay in a poor disposition because you think that this thing has now become a part of your permanent reality. What is your permanent reality? That you are a child of God that you are an immortal part, you are part of an immortal thought of God, that you have the Christ within you. Those are part of your permanent reality. All the other things that we experience in life, they are part of a temporary um, illusion that is around you. So why not connect up to what is your true permanent reality, the Christ within you, the image of God that you are, and even though it does not totally show now, know that it is already a part of you. God has already made you his child. So why stress out and despair and try to make the uh, 
problem situations something that appear to be permanent when they're not permanent things that are material are not permanent they pass away and you can hurry them along by saying i'm not going to let stress be the part of what makes me make this decision i'm not going to let despair and the fact that I'm in a poor disposition, that I'm a part in a in a position in life that is not permanent, that we can do something about it. Uh, and, but again, you recognize the these stressors, you recognize these the things that make you despair in their poor disposition. But said, always have in your mind is they are not permanent. This can change. This is something that does not reach, that does not fulfill the true image that God has for us. So it has to be what? Temporary. If it's something that is not reflecting the truth of God, it has to be a temporary thing. And no matter how much people tell you, oh no, that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a leader, I can do things. Uh, uh, I can make things happen in your life. You are, they are not God. They cannot permanently impact your spirit and your soul. So the only they can do is something temporary that can put you into stress, despair, and a poor disposition, but that's not your permanent reality. You had to connect up to the permanent reality and find that potentate within you, that ability to make changes where they thought, and they would call them miracles. How did they get through that? How did they do that? Because you realize that there is a Christ within you. There's a power within you to be able to overcome all of their illusions and all of their uh, fakeness, all of their uh, bragging and all of their delusion, God can help you to overcome it. So know that the power of positive th thinking can reshape your life. The power of positive thinking can reshape your life. And it doesn't, and when you're saying the power of positive thinking, it doesn't mean that you have to not recognize the truth of the things that are around you. That's not the positive part of it. The positive part, uh, in fact, when we're, one of the things that the psalm that we're reading, the 60th psalm, when you're reading that, you can see how truthful uh, that psalmster was about the situation. In fact, I'm going to go back to that song for a minute. It says, uh, this psalm starts off in, in a very uh, 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 place that a lot of people would despair over because it says, you have rejected us, O Lord. You have broken us. You have been angry. So it's starting off with truly where they are. And then in the last, then this, this is the first verse. It says, okay, God, you've done all those things. And now it says what? Restore us. So it's saying, with all the things that have been happening, I'm going to go to God and ask him to do what? Restore me. Restore me to it. So it's not saying that I have not, felt that I have gone through problems, that I have not, uh, these things have broken me or, I'm, uh, or I haven't been shown any, the anger hasn't been shown against me. But this one verse saying that I don't see any of those as a permanent part of my reality. I don't see the rejection that I have on the go. I haven't seen the fact that I have been broken. I have not seen the anger that has been torn to me. None of those are permanent parts of my reality and i am going to call on the one you know that potentate that power to do what restore us take me back to where i was um then that's why i say that when we talk about positive thinking the positive part of it is the part when you can think that there is a power that can resolve and renew and uh, establish you again that's why your positive thinking doesn't have to be uh, uh, illusion, an illusion of what's going to happen. It can be the real truth that you have been in a low position and that from positive thinking, you're saying, I can, re God can reshape me in this because I know that God has said that I am created in this image, that God wants me to, um, uh, to prosper and be in good health. That is something that he, uh, is a permanent part. And I just need to get out of where I am and get to what God wants me to be. That's to me is positive thinking. It's not this trick of words that you're saying, oh, you just say things in, in with positive uh, verbs and positive nouns. 
No, that positive part is to recognize the truth that you are a child of God, that the Christ is within you, and that no matter what things you, what situations you encounter in life, that you can be restored to what God originally made you. So it's saying the way to use positive thinking and the best way is use it to reshape your life. Say so align your thinking with positive attitudes of the universe. And that, that's why there's so many Psalms and things out there that let you know that God can restore you, that God can heal you, that God can empower you, that God can give you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So the positive thing, uh, to me, positive thinking is, is you keep aligning yourself back with, uh, from, but it's from, it's from the reality of where you are to where you need to go to. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to over, uh, you don't have to um, uh, try to ignore the truth of your situation. You can see the truth of your situation, but still know that there's a power behind you to get you to a better situation. So align your thinking with positive attitudes of the universe. Know that God is there to align you and to get you into the right place. But, but to do that, you have to uh, recognize the, the negative synergy and, and negative situation but do not just succumb to say, I'm going to stay in it. Uh, the next line says, do not succumb to negative energy or negative people who are negatively influenced and as such create cycles of negative experiences. So it's saying that they, um, and they, there are people who uh, you would want you to succumb by promoting uh, negative images and negative things around you. And because they want you to succumb to them, they want you to think that the negative things, and most of the times it's the negative energy is often lies. They want you to think that the lie is the truth or think that they have so much power that they can make the lie your reality. And you have to stand up and say, I am not going to succumb to these negative energies. I'm not going to let, make, let them make me think that a lie is the truth. And this week, I found that you have to be very, very careful of, um, uh, of being so positive that you don't recognize when lies are coming at you. Uh, and that, so that's the problem with uh, some people, that they think that just to be able to tell a lie uh, that you think is what you want will make it true. And this came up uh, uh, as uh, one of the things that we're working with. Uh, when I'm working with um, uh, one of the history organizations is uh, this organization out of uh, Montgomery, Alabama uh, that has created this, uh, these monuments about lynching. And we said, wow, monuments about lynching. Uh, aren't that, isn't that something negative? Why would we want to have monuments uh, uh, that recognizes all the people that were lynched and have some type of memorial for all these people who were lynched. What is the logic behind that? That's not positive thinking. Shouldn't we think about something more positive? But in it, I had to, because we were having a meeting uh, with some, uh, one because one of the things that this organization want to work with is convicts and how the, all the inadequate things, they uh, all the, the, the bad things that way that they are handling convicts, the mass incarcerations, especially against black people, that they find ways to lock you up and 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 keep you there for long periods of time. Uh, how they try to get it so that even young uh, young black people are tried like adults. And I had to read the explanation of the man of why he felt it was so important to put up these monuments about things like lynching. And the, the answer to it was kind of surprising because one of the things he says that one, the, the main reason he does this is because when you only show the successes of the civil rights movement, you give people a false impression of what needs to be done. I want you to think about it. When you only show the successes of the civil rights movement, you give people the false impression about what needs to be done. 
and he was talking about how you we have so many people you know uh, especially of the other uh, uh, cultures that would say things are fine you know one of the reasons they say things are fine because every example you show me of the civil rights movement actually shows many success you show me how Martin Luther King was successful in getting lunch counters integrated you show me how um, the Freedom Riders were successful of stopping segregated areas in on buses and um, and um, uh, the you know waiting rooms uh, and water fountains. You're showing me these successes, and when I look around me now, I look around and I don't see any uh, colored bathrooms. I don't see uh, a a place where you can put uh, a lunchroom and say is white only. And so I have to assume that what? There have been successes, things are better. And because I just see those successes, I have to believe that there's no problem. Everything is better now. But he said, but when you show the history of how people were when he shows these things like these lynchings. And then when they talk about the lynchings, they talk about this notion of terrorizing people. Uh, and that this notion of terrorizing people started with slavery. One of the biggest ways that they kept slavery going was to terrorize people about it. Terrorize you as a slave, terrorize those people who would think they would help black people, they terrorize them. And when slavery was outlawed and taken away, they switched it over to lynching, to terrorizing people. So this, uh, he says that they, some of the worst things that they did about white supremacy, uh, which normally was taking on these ideas of terrorizing people, that they keep just switching and changing it to terrorize people in a different way. So you terrorize them during slavery, you terrorize them during lynching. Lynching became terrorizing them with mass incarceration. And you see uh, now even police brutality of a way to do what? Terrorize. So this problem of terrorizing people has been a constant problem. And by showing the fact that you're going to recognize that this was a problem, that lynching was a problem, it was trying to terrorize people that that will open up the conversation that you can start to continue to talk about how do we get rid of uh, supporting and allowing this terror to continue. And by just showing the positive things, the positive success of the civil rights movement, you are not actually looking at the real problem. And so to get a positive conversation about what needs to be done you need to look at some of the acts of terror and the people who were terrorized by that thing, and then you can start open a conversation to make things better. Have any questions or comments? But to do uh, be positive is you don't you do not succumb to negative energy uh, or negative people. Because, you know, and, and, and when I started reading about why it was important to, to, to look at uh, some of the people who had lynched and how terrible that was to give people the idea of start saying, let's make some positive changes. Let's start trying to deal, because if you even look at what happened in the Capitol, it was an act of terrorizing. They wanted to make you so fearful that you would accept uh, the lie of who they thought should be the president but it's showing by showing that they could terrorize you by having uh, a storm of people to come and tear down the Capitol building. That's an act of terror. So we're still dealing with these acts of terror as a way to try to control us. And we need to recognize that those are acts of terror, but that God can restore us, that we can restore this country and get this country back to its real promise of freedom, justice, and liberty for all um, but we can't do it by just turning our heads and saying, oh, you know, things are better now. We'll just look at the successes and we'll just do that. No, you have to say, 
what is wrong and how we're going to stay fast in trying to improve those things. So that's why I think it says in here, do not succumb to negative energies and negative people who are negatively influenced and as such create cycles of negative experiences. So you'll see that through the negative energy, they keep creating these negative cycles of terrorizing and believing that terror is a way to make the nation a better nation. And it is not terror. You do not need people living in terror, people living in fear as their motive to do things, uh, to make things better. We have to see how the potential for, uh, for love, for joy, and for justice can help us to make this a better place. And this is where the line that we use as, as the opening says, there is a well of potential that you need to discover and tap. So to me, that's that Christ consciousness within. It is that well, and it's a well that has the power to use love, to use, um, and I'm just not talking about a love to just stand back, it's that love that will stand up and be strong, uh, a faith that will stand up like an armor against the things of the evil, uh, where it has that truth, where it has righteousness, or where it has the preparation of peace, where it has all these, the shield of faith uh, to be able to stop, that there is a well of potential that we need to discover that that well is within us, that we don't have to ignore problems, that we can discover that which is an answer to our problems. And we can discover it and we can actually tap into it. That means just don't know it's there, but you got to be actively uh, tapping into it, working to help to, to uh, release uh, the possibilities of the things that you can do. And it says, applying the principles of truth is the best means to have them work in your circumstances. So it's saying you have to learn what these truth principles are and you have to learn actually how to apply them. Applying them is an important part of it. Not just knowing them and saying, oh, I have this, I know that I'm a child of God. How do you apply your uh, son and daughtership with God to your life? How do you actually use it in your circumstances? How do you demand it in your circumstances uh, uh, so that they can actually uh, work in your life? It means discover your potential, but you gotta actually tap into it. Say the truth that arranged and established a new life of beauty for others can work for you. So say when you use the truth, it is already arranged and established a new life of beauty for others, but that can work for you and it directs you and encourages you to work it and act to make desirable changes in your life so it says start to work and you can start with yourself that lesson last week was talking about i think it was last week by getting the beam out of your own eye that you can start working it and acting on it and it will start making desirable changes in your life and then the last two lines says, read the 60th Psalm, burn a green and purple candle together for this month. Any comments or questions? Yes, once again, uh, Shalom. Shalom. I tell you, this, this lesson is, is awesome, Father. It's, it's all over me. Uh, you know, the, the, the toughest thing, uh, sometimes we don't, we don't want to uh, accept the things that uh, God is trying to show us, uh, whether it be with our family or our children, our friends, people that we associate with, you know, and and what you come to find out, those are some of the people. I can't speak for other people, but me, those are some of the people that keeping scratch in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, keeping all this trickery and all this defiant in my life. And you know, God had to show me. You know, you have to be willing to rise up mm -hmm. above the occasions. You know. Uh, for instance, my daughter Charity, you know, like you were saying, some people they know the pressure points, they know what to do to keep you stressed out, they know what to say, they they know how to lay it down to make you feel like, oh, okay, you know, even whether it's with their own kids or their own mm -hmm. circumstances, you know, and I and so he put in my spirit, okay, take them same things that they trying to use against you and you just lay it out there in front of them, let them know that hey. This is what you're using to scratch me out, but I'm not going to let it scratch me. I'm going to take control of it. Why do you continue to 
throwing my face about your tag when God bless you with the means not only to get the car but to get the tag, but you choose not to get the tag, mm -hmm. but you want to keep throwing that at me to put pressure on me to make me feel, you know, some type of way like it's my fault that you didn't get your tag. Yeah. So I told her, I said, okay, well, I think the, my two grandkids, now all of a sudden they're back sick again. But when I had them, God helped me, and he, he allowed them to be cured from their sickness, the cold and the, and, the, and the running noses and the fever. Now they're back there again, but you keep telling me. So I told her, I said, well, bring the kids over. I'm going to keep them for the weekend. The mm -hmm. first thing she going to throw Daddy, you know you know my tag bad. No, you know your tag bad. But y'all have another car every time I see you and this, you and your, your significant other, y'all riding around, y'all doing this in his car. But now when I tell you to bring the kids to me, you can't y'all can't use his car, but you want me to get up out of my bed to stop what I'm doing to travel way across town to get the kids that you have now allowed to get sick again. And I tell her I'm not finna do it. I said, Okay then, no problem bye. I'll talk mm -hmm. to you later. See, mm -hmm. sometimes we have to we have to know that it's okay to step back, yeah. you know, without feeling guilt, without mm -hmm. feeling that, you know, okay, now you don't cause my high blood pressure to go up, my pressure to go up, or you got me feeling some type of way, but I'm not going to let you do that to me no more. I'm going to let you go ahead and do what y'all do because the simple fact is I see, now I understand your game. I see what you've been trying to do, all this, this uh, what you want to call it, trickery and Yes. And evil doing or whatever, and, and all this stuff to keep me scratched, but I'm not going to let you keep me scratched no more because you took what I said, you and your sister, y'all taking what I said when I said I want to come up here and be close to my family and my kids and my grandkids. Y'all taking it and y'all putting a spin on it and a twist to use yeah. it for y'all benefit. So mm -hmm. now I got to take all that back and let y'all see that, hey, I'm here, but I'm not going to, that don't work no more with me because like you said, I am a child of God. I do keep God close to me. God do direct me. So why would I let that bother me? What y'all trying to do yes. and knowing that, Hey, this is not the path that God was taking me down. I put myself into that situation, but I'm going to pull myself back out of it. Just like I put myself in it, but with the strength of God, I'm going to move forward because I am a child of God. So I'm yes. going to keep reading this word. I'm going to keep my faith. And I'm going to stay focused on him. I'm going to stay over here in this lane where y'all supposed to be at instead of in this lane where y'all trying to keep me at. So I just thank God for this lesson because it's all over me this morning. And uh, I'm I just so grateful that I, I was able to get on the line this morning because I always feel like when you do miss a day off this line, you're missing a word, you're missing a blessing, you're missing your food, you're missing something that can can girt your spirit back up to, to put you back in line where you're supposed to be. So shalom again, and I thank God for the lesson. You're doing a wonderful, great job, like always. Thank you for sharing that, because that that's part of what he's saying about that people will try to create these, uh, through negative energy, they'll create this negative experience with you, this negative cycle. They'll create this cycle, and you keep getting back over and over and over again. And one of the lines says, don't be satisfied with the same situation. And you can change that situation, but if you keep falling in that trap that that person knows that they can get you in, then you're not trying to create a change. You're trying to create the same negative thing that they had before. And if it didn't work for you the last time, at what point are you going to learn that I got to do something different? I got to live my life my way. I cannot let people keep manipulating me into uh, a, a negative position. And you're right. A lot of times they do it um just because they think they can um so yes let that spirit guide you and, and teach you of when you need to sometime just let them uh uh let them go and uh, uh when you can't help when you can't go outside that they're not going to take the steps that they need to take to do themselves and just keep working on like i said that that being within you working on that stress that it gives you, that the spirit you give you to go to God. And, and sometimes when you make those decisions, you have to go to God and say, you know, God, let me know if, if what I did was the right thing. Because I don't want to sit around stressing over this. I, you know, I had this feeling on me that I shouldn't be doing that. If, you know, show me that, you know, uh, uh, help me to realize that what I have done is pleasing in your sight. Because remember, that's, you know, a lot of times we go into situations and we try to be pleasing 
and uh and all you know we try to be pleasing in our uh, uh our spouse's sight be pleasing in our brother's sight be pleasing in our mother's sight or our, you know or uh the, the person that you're trying to attract but you have to live so you are pleasing in god's sight and when you are pleasing in god's sight you can go through those situations and go to god and say god Am I pleasing in your sight? And if I am pleasing in your sight, restore me to the joy that I know that I have with you. Restore me to that faith that I can have that you are part of my life. Because people will have you uh, uh, working yourself so hard that you will kill yourself. And, uh, and remember, early part said, you gotta do things that you can find joy in to kind of de-stress uh, uh, take away some of that despair and some of that uh, poor dispositions that you get in by going to God and say, God, I've done this. If this was not pleading, pleasing in your sight, show me how to do it so it will be pleasing in your sight. But I don't think that I need to keep going through this cycle of foolishness uh, over and over again, by, especially by people who have kind of found this thing in me that they can just keep using it over and over again till they wear me out. Say, I don't want to be wore out, Lord. Strengthen me, give me, give me the joy and the loving kindness that comes from you. And oh, please open my eyes to be able to see when people are trying to steal my joy. Because a lot of times that's what they want to do. They want to steal, steal or take away from you the joy that they know that you're getting from God. They want to try to put you back, you know, it's like uh, they always talk about crabs in a barrel. Keep, they want to pull you back into their own feelings of uh, despair and their own stress. And, but you can't let them, uh, or you shouldn't, uh, or, or I should say, don't let them keep pulling you back into those ne negative situations. Find ways to go to God and ask God, God, is what I'm doing pleasing in your sight? And if it's not pleasing in your sight, Show me how I can do it in a way that is pleasing in your sight and does not, and that keeps me, keeps me in my joy. Because if God does not want you stressed, God does not want you to be in despair, God does not want you to be in a poor disposition. So if God shows you to do a thing, it should come with joy. The things that God, the things that you do that are pleasing in God's sight are going to come with the joy, the love, and the faith that God wants you to have. Do have someone else would like to speak? I just wanted to say it was a very good lesson. Thank you, thank you. And the thing is, you can't let them steal your joy. That's what I used to say when I was at work. Yes. And, and but, they would try it. Will they try yeah, it though? <laughs> yeah. But I used to say that in the back of my mind. And then one day, um, some uh, one day I told them that. I said, you know what? Y'all can do what you want to do, but I'm not going to let y'all uh, steal my joy. And um, they, they used to look at me like I was crazy when I, you know, mm -hmm. when I would um, not be paying any attention to what that foolishness that they had going on. Yeah. Because they're so used to you falling mm -hmm. for it. And then too, I, I, I've come to realize even when I'm retired, I, I have to work with myself because there are things that come that have come into my life since I retired. It, I find it, it ain't people, it's me. Mm -hmm. it, and I have to, to, to get pull myself up out of the, out of the negative things that's coming at me and, and can't succumb um, to those thoughts and those feelings yes. because I, I've done that and, I, and I'm and i glad you brought this lesson because it has come as an eye opener that, that before it was people, mm -hmm. but now it's not people, it's, it's me and my, mm -hmm. it's me. Yeah, what it because is. You, can me. you can change you more than you can change the other person. Yeah. That's what I think he talks about is expecting the other person eye and a beam in your own eye. You can change yourself more than you can change other people. And even some of the things about positive thinking is saying, 
change yourself first. Sometimes we are so concerned about changing the other person, we don't know that our greatest potential is to help change ourselves, to change you. You have more potential to change you than you do other people. And so you need to take that time to change yourself. Um, yes, the other person may have something that is a problem, but you changing that in their life is only going to be a speck of a change. You know, because when we talk about a, a beam in your eye and a speck in the other person's eye, um, when you have a, uh, a dust in your own eye, it becomes like a beam. It can shut down your whole eye, right? But if it's some dust in the other person's eye, you look at it and you see it as a what? A speck of dust. Now to them, it might be their beam, but for you, it is a speck. And when I, he was talking about taking the beam out of your own eye instead of the speck of the other one, I think what Jesus was saying is, you can do more to help yourself than you can do to help anybody else. But you have to work on yourself. And when you're working on yourself, you'll be moving beams out of your pathway of seeing good. But when you go and just take a, a, a work on the other person, you've only made a very small change in your life. So if you want to have the biggest impact of changing your life, you got to work on self first. And when you start working those things in your life, and when you start taking, like I said, and once you start taking those big problems away from yourself, you can help other people uh, to see that because if you start taking those beams out of your own eye and people start saying, oh, wow, they seem to do much better without the beam in their eye, uh, let them let me find out how they did that so I can get this beam out of, for, because from the other person's standpoint, the speck that you see in the eye is a beam to them. But if they, if you show that you can get the, the beam out of your own eye, you can show others how to get beams out of their eyes. But it's not going to be the big, the big impact is not going to be in your life. The big impact is going to be to the person who has something blocking their vision. So you can do more to open your own vision than you can to open someone else's vision. And in life, you have to start working on how can I get, how can I get uh, the stress out of my life? How can I get the despair out of my life? How can I get the poor dis disposition out of my life? But part of that is not falling into the tricks, succumbing to that negative energy. Uh, and negative not meaning they said uh, a negative word, but that idea of what they want you to get into is something that is non-productive for you, something that blocks your vision, something that stops you from being able to see that you are a potentate, you are a child of God, you are a divine spirit that was in you. And that spirit wants to be able to walk with you. It wants to, like we say in our witch call them, you want to have that uh, divine love illuminating your life. You want to have that divine will guiding your life. You want to have the truth taking out all the errors that you have in your life. And you want that divine love to be always in your heart. Any other comments or questions? I have a comment. Hey, Mother Loretta. I just want to thank God today for that temple. Oh. <laughs> that temple had great potential. Yes. And thank you, Father, for having the stamina, the integrity, and the courage to help to keep that temple open. You saw great potential in something to do and not just let it just sit up there and waste away. And to have it restored and to look the way it looked, I'm still in awe. Oh, thank you. I was smiling yesterday and still smiling. Every time I think about how it looked and how good you feel in there, it's a real uplift. And that lets us know even that had potential. Mm -hmm. And look at the good change that it made in fixing of everything. It makes you want to just shout to glory to see the way that it is. And you'd be so elated just to look around and awe and see how beautiful 
you know, that it is and what it came from to what it is now, because everything is subject to change. Mm-hmm. And it was a good change. And to have you to, and, and, and St. Teresa, too, I thank God for her, too. Me too. Yes, me, too. <laughs> And she, you bet, you better. That's why I'm saying it. You better be grateful because I shall be on you. Yeah, yeah. I thank God for her because she, she has the hookup. She knows people, you know, and one thing about her, she doesn't try to just take over everything. You know, she want to ask your opinion and want you to, you know, help and fill in and fill out what things need to be done in you asking you what you think or how things look. That's what we all try to do for the improvement and the betterment of it. But, you know, it, it takes a whole lot for one person. That's a lot on your shoulders, Father, to even have to try to do that well, and to take courage. And starting with Teresa. Uh, because remember, yeah, a lot of those so, things, in there, it took a lot of searching for uh, materials for paint colors. Of course, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, tiles, uh, just researching stuff. You know, looking. You know, even now we're looking for chairs. It's a lot of research that goes in it. A lot of uh, stumbling blocks you run into. Uh, it's a, a lot of things. And and it's and a lot game, of work. It's a lot of work. And I think what um, is more difficult for people to see is when they come in the temple. And they see how it, you know, how the interior looks. They don't know of some of the other problems, like the above right. the ceiling problems. They don't know what condition that roof was in, because actually more money actually has gone into getting and the roof, the roof, than yeah. has gone into the things that they could see. And I think one of the reasons, you know, but. I think spiritually, you feel, you start feeling that even the 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 the, uh, the the joy of the roof, rejoicing that it has been fixed, and no people don't see that. But I think it was it's it's a lot um, uh, that has gone into uh, you know working with the you know working with the contractors to get them to come in to find them to deal with their uh, the changes and all the things, but. I do believe that, you know, that place is a blessed place and I want it to be for other generations to be able to go there and feel the beauty of what uh, Supreme Mother created uh, as a spot uh, and, and get ready for a, a, a new generation to be able to learn how blessed that Christ within you is. Uh, That's to- right. That's right. It took a whole lot of work. And it's just not the inside. It's it's all the way around because that roof was a a, a great problem. Yeah. And through that, by being the problem, that's what opened up the door to get everything else fixed. Yes. And we thank God, and and I also thank God for Blake. Oh yes. For for doing what he does, and when I get a chance, I'm gonna tell him. You have to give people their flowers when they're yes. living. Yes. Give He's, them the credit when they're here, and let them know that you appreciate what they do and what they've done Mm -hmm. because it takes a whole lot, you know, for a person to even want to go in and help and do things. And I'm just grateful. And I thank God. And I know if grandma was alive and living, I know in the home of her soul, her spirit knows (laughs) she sees, but she also guided us all in the right direction as to helping the person that needed to come in Mm-hmm. And to fix, everybody had a part in that puzzle to get things fixed, and it worked out. It was a jigsaw puzzle, but now it's all into place. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank God for you and uh, St. Teresa. Love you, Teresa. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm over too. That's my. Sweet you you better. <laughs> and, thank um, God for you both. Thank you. Uh, but it was a labor. The good thing about it is a labor of love, because uh, yeah, yeah. Even when Teresa talks about it, she talks about how good she feels about even all the work she had to to, to put into it. So yeah. Uh, so it even makes it better when it's a labor of love, and when and you can right. You know, and especially when you see when it starts coming together, and you can see it actually impacts people to come there. Um, 
and to, to feel different about the place. Because I've even seen it when she came there, she's saying, you know, this is a totally different feeling because in many ways, when people came in there and they saw it in the old way, they would actually get more depressed um, because it, it hadn't changed. And when they come in and see that it's like a whole new look, it actually uh, relieves them and right. it them to find more joy on the, the beauty of the lessons that have been there to see it go through those changes. So it's a, it was a labor of love uh, and we're glad that we have something that we can pass on to, to other generations. Any other questions or comments before we do our dismissal? And uh, again, in memory of uh, our Supreme Mother, I have a uh, have this message that I've been using for her for the year, and it says, "I shall thank and praise God, His understanding." I say hallelujah to that. That we just need to praise God and thank God because it's God's understanding. Even some of the things that we're saying that we're building for the temple, I, I believe God was at work helping lead us and guide us into the things that we needed for this. So. Our illuminated Supreme Mother, we're blessed to have your words that we shall thank and praise God for his understanding. And I would like to, again, thank you all for being with, the, with me on this service today. Um, and know that you, you, I, I still got to catch up with the website, but our website is www.spiritualguidancetemple.org. And I, I'll get there. I'll get it caught up. And thank you for um, being to. That, that we're, we're thankful to have that website and being able to put our messages up on there. And we will uh, continue with that. And thank you for uh, those who have been able to donate to us. That has been a great help. And it's going to be, uh, uh, I think I think we're in, going to be in a growing, you know, as we get more back into the, that new tempo and uh, still do some things on the video with that, in that new site, that it's going to help us to grow better so thank you very much for your for your support and now for the dismissal oh are there any announcements anything that we need to announce this week i need to get that i think we're pretty good i think uh birthdays i can think of anything so if not let me just go on to say may the love of god illuminate your way may the will of god direct you each day May the truth of God all errors depart, and may the peace of God forever dwell in your heart. Amen, amen, amen.